So uh, welcome everybody to the first meeting for 2022. Sorry, it took such a long time to find out what the topic is going to be because even I wasn't sure. But fortunately, I went with the home team, um, but we'll get to that in a moment. So I'm gonna turn this over to Matt, who is our new president. Matt, do you want to answer the question that I posed to you in an email that you didn't answer? You don't have to, wasn't expecting that. But how did you come to be a mycologist? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, thanks a lot, Catherine. Um, yeah, so for Greg, did you have a, did Greg have a question first? Oh, I was just gonna follow up before we go. Could Kathy started this wonderful conversation about Beatrice Potter, but I just wanted to fill in the rest of the story. She didn't want to write children books. She actually wanted to be a mycologist. But at that time, when she tried to publish her first work on, I think it was on Puffballs or Stars, um, she was um, rejected because women didn't do that type of thing. And so she gave up and she, then the world got, uh, you know, Peter Rabbit instead. But um, this was a case where um, she butted up against, um, the male dominated sciences and was not allowed to pursue what was really her first love, which was mycology. So that's all I wanted to say. That's, come away. That's terrific, Greg. That's a nice additional piece. All right, Mr. Matt, it's up to you. Okay, um, so in terms of how did I get started in mycology, um, it, it's, a couple, it's kind of a multi-step process, but basically when I was young, I grew up in the countryside. My parents bought me this butterfly book and I used to go out in the field next door collecting butterflies. And that's kind of what piqued my interest in nature originally. Um, but then I got to college and I knew I wanted to do something kind of related to the outdoors, but didn't really know very much and started taking a botany class. And we talked about lichens in there. And I thought that was kind of interesting. And then right around that time, there's a National Geographic that came out that uh, actually had a whole special on, on lichens with all sorts of just really beautiful pictures in here. Um, and so that further kind of piqued my interest um, in, in fungi. Uh, fast forward a few years, I took a mycology course. Um, I think honestly, partially it was just, I thought it sounded kind of crazy and weird. I was in college and I was like, you can take an entire course on fungi. And uh, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Had to do a senior thesis project soon and decided I wanted to do it on lichens. And uh, from there, a number of opportunities, people were very generous to me and provided me with different opportunities along the way to help me to continue pursuing my interests. And the it was just one of those situations where the more I learned, the deeper I got and just continued to find it extremely fascinating and wanted to, to do more and more and more, <laughs> go as far as I could. So um, that's kind of how I, I got started. Um, oh, you're, you're, you're fine. Thank you so much. And you missed Greg's comment back in November. He was almost a band leader, a band director that was. for high school. I, I saw the question posed and I was very much wondering who, <laughs> who the answer was. That's really cool. Okay. And, and I almost what, was in a, I was thinking about going to school for accounting. Um, so, yeah. See, right. it could have been an accountant. And your partner in crime is not here tonight because he has a new baby. Correct, correct. So I'm flying solo tonight. Um, Todd is a, a great person. He's the collections manager at the, the Field Museum. Um, and I'm going to be taking over his part. We kind of made this... Um, two-part presentation for a outreach event we did at the museum. And I think some, a, a lot of this, I think folks might know already, um, but I think hopefully there'll be some new kind of tidbits of information in there. This was originally kind of intended for a non-mycological audience. Um, and one of the goals of it was to kind of try to illustrate that fungi aren't all terrible, awful things that will kill you dead. I feel like that's kind of how I was raised in this sort of like mycophobic society that fungi are kind of bad. Um, but as you look into them, sure, some really are, but there's a lot of really, really cool ones. Um, and a lot of them are very, very beneficial that, and we need them for very imp important um, purposes. So they play key roles in our, our ecosystem. Um, 
Um, so thanks, thanks again, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Nelson. I'm a researcher at the Field Museum. Um, and as I mentioned, this is something uh, Todd and I had prepared together a while ago. And what we want to kind of talk about today is um, what I'd like to talk about today is two things. First off, I'd like to kind of provide a, a little bit of a background, a little bit of overview about fungi, what they are, and kind of the magnitude of diversity, um, both in terms of species richness as well as um, ecological functions. And then um, I'd like to focus on two groups of, of macro fungi, basically. So kind of the larger things you might see out there in nature. Um, and by that, I mean things like mushrooms and then um, lichens. And we're going to kind of use those to explore this question of whether fungi are friendly or deadly. So kind of launching into the first part, just what are fungi, what fungi may have seen. These are things you probably all already know, but most people tend to think of mushrooms. Um, they tend to think of, you know, this white button mushroom you get in the grocery store, or they might think about yeast. Um, you can see here when we zoom in on them, we get these little microscopic cells here. When they divide, they make these little scars you can kind of see on here. But this, these are two fungi that, you know, kind of a lot of people, um, use every day more or less. But most people, I would say, in my opinion, at least don't think beyond that very much. They don't think about what else is going on out there in nature. And when we look, we can see there's just a tremendous diversity out there. Um, just all sorts of shapes, colors, and sizes, just really, really beautiful um, different organisms that exist out there. And one of the first questions that kind of comes up is when we start thinking about fungi, how many species are we talking about here? Um, so just to place this in the context of other organisms, we think about how many bird species there are. There's under 12,000. Mammals, it's only like 6,500 or 7,000. Ants, 13 and a half thousand. And uh, when, we, when we think about fungi, we actually see there's a lot. So you would be right here if you answered either three or four. So basically, the why this is so ambiguous is that we know of about 120,000 or so species that have been formally described by scientists. You can kind of argue back and forth about what the exact number is, but it's in that sort of ballpark. But we also know that we don't know a lot. And so there's been a number of different estimates that folks have come up with, um, including, including Greg Mueller here, for instance. He's uh, come up with some different estimates as well. By and large, most of them tend to kind of come in at around a million or more, sometimes 750,000. But you can see, regardless, we know we don't know a lot. And so there's a lot of hidden diversity out there and a lot of work that um, is being done now to try to identify these fungi and formally catalog them. And part of the reason uh, we don't, part of the reason we know so little about them is that in many cases they're kind of hidden. We might only see that mushroom for a little part of the year. The rest of the time it's hidden down in its food source. It's hidden down in the soil or in a log, just in this filamentous form and we might miss it. Or it might be some sort of yeast that's really difficult to see. Um, so we can see there's a lot more to be found out there. The next question um, is another one that everyone seemed to know already, which is really great. Um, what, what exactly is a fungus? So you can see, you know, plants. Um, for instance, I work in a, a botany department. <laughs> the, the fungi at the museum are housed in the botanical collection. So there's kind of this historical legacy of people thinking that fungi might be these sorts of like degenerate plants that have lost photosynthesis. Um, Another idea is that perhaps they're animals. Um, I actually got in an argument with someone at the, the barber shop this morning about that, who was <laughs> saying yeasts are animals. And I said, no, they are not. They are not. Um, or the answer is neither. And most folks guess neither. And that's exactly what I was trying to tell this person at the, the barber shop, that they are <laughs> indeed not animals. However, they are uh, more closely related to animals than they are to plants. So what this is here, this is basically just kind of a fancy way that we can use to sort of illustrate evolutionary relationships among different groups of organisms. You can kind of think of it as like a family tree. And so basically the closer you are together, the more closely related you are. And so we have fungi here circled in this kind of orangey color on the bottom. 
And then you can see animals over here in this kind of purplish color. So fungi and animals are more or less kind of sister groups is what we would call them. They're each other's uh, closest relatives. And then when we think about plants, they're nowhere near. They're way, way over here, way up top here um, in this green. And so what makes these things different? Well, when we think about plants, they are autotrophs. So they're able to make their own food. That's what that means. They're able to use uh, sunlight, air, water, uh, and they're able to use their chlorophyll to photosynthesize and make food for themselves. Fungi can't do that. These are, in, these are heterotrophs. So that means they need to get their food from somewhere else. They're not able to synthesize their own food. Similarly, uh, animals are heterotrophs. So when we think about them, they go around and they engulf their food. They eat it. They kind of wrap around it and ingest it. As we mentioned, fungi are also heterotrophs, but instead of eating it like that, instead of like engulfing it, what they do is they absorb it. They have this nifty uh, uh, way of eating their food in which they can release enzymes. So what the fungus does on the bottom right here, you can kind of see is that it's the fungus makes these threads, these filaments uh, that grow around and they can grow into the food or near it. And they release these chemicals, these enzymes that will break down that food into a form that they can then absorb. So it's a really neat way of doing this kind of external digestion. And so this raises the question of, okay, fungi can't make their own food. What on earth, how are they getting food? Um, so they do it in a few ways. One of which is that they might just eat dead things. So on the left here, we have this dung fungus called pylobolus, which is a really cool one. You should look up on YouTube if you haven't seen, but this is one that lives on poop <laughs> and it fills up with water. You can see that kind of swollen cell, that bulbous cell there. It uses these carotenoids to kind of aim itself towards the light. It fills up with water and bursts and it shoots the spores. There's a little black packet of spores on the top and it shoots them off. And these end up taking off at a just incredible speed. One of the, I think one of the fastest speeds some um, organisms have been recorded uh, actually, actually uh, shooting off uh, at. So we can, some of them eat dead things. Um, another one here on the right, we have this daedalia. That's, um, you might see these shelf fungi growing on dead wood. So again, they're decomposing that dead wood there. But a lot of other fungi have instead evolved the capacity to form partnerships with living organisms. And these can kind of span this continuum from mutualism, where it's beneficial for both partners involved, to parasitism, um, in which one partner is benefiting and the other isn't. We've got a couple ones here. We're going to talk a little bit more about mycorrhizal fungi here. These are this beneficial um, mutualistic kind of association. Um, here we have one that you probably see in the fall around the Chicago area, this Phrytisma. It's a very weak pathogen of, of maple leaves. It makes this tar spot on there. Kind of it just mainly discolors it and it's not killing the tree, but it's taking a little bit of taking a little bit of carbon, but not really giving anything back. So now as we think more about fungi, what are they? How do they, what, what do they look like? How, do, how exactly are they working? So we can see that most of these fungi, there's, there's certainly exceptions to this, but most of the ones we're going to encounter are gonna make these little tubes or filaments, these little like hairs or threads that grow around. And we call these hyphae. And what these do is they can grow through um, soil or wood. And ultimately they're, what they're doing is they're trying to find food. So they're out on the search for food, looking around. But hyphae can also do some really neat things. So some of them uh, have evolved the capacity to uh, such that these hyphae are able to kind of stick together and make these really complicated new structures together filled with tons and tons of hyphae. So some of them just kind of go out individual threads like that, but some of them they can aggregate and they can make these neat structures like mushrooms, these specialized organs or a lichen thallus, for instance. And this is kind of what we're going to focus on tonight are, are mushrooms and lichens, two of these kind of large kind of charismatic groups of um, macro fungi. So um, here's just a few pictures of some different mushrooms and, and lichens here, uh, including the Lacaria. Shout out to Greg here. It's a nice purple one I saw in Wisconsin. Um, and there's just there's tons and tons of cool things fungi do, and we're not going to be able to cover all these interactions. I have a whole separate presentation, you know, 
in which we can talk about some of the different cool ways insects and fungi um, interact with one another. <laughs> but what we're going to do is just focus on a few um, different stories tonight and kind of briefly touch on that. So we mentioned mushrooms. What exactly are they? Um, so when we look at them, what we see is that this is actually this aggregation of lots of those hyphae or filaments. If we were to look inside it, we would see lots of different threads in there. And they form this kind of stalk here or stipe, this cap. And when you flip it over, you, you've likely noticed that they might have gills on the bottom or pores. You might be asking, what's up with those? What, what's the point of those gills and pores? And what happens is if we were to look on the inside of those gills or those pores, we would see that they're lined with these specialized cells called basidia, um, these kind of inflated cells with these little uh, forks coming off, little tips coming off here, and spores. And what happens is those spores will then um, shoot off of the, the gill. So if the gill is oriented like this, the, the basidia would sh uh, shoot the spores out like that, like that. Right and right, kind of towards the gill next to it, and they would just go a little distance and drop down, just shoot out a little bit, drop down, and the idea is that they then will catch the air and kind of float away from that parent. And so it's 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 a good idea. You can think about it. It might be good to drop your spores right underneath you because where you are living is a place that has all the resources you need to survive. But at the same time, if you drop all your offspring right where you are, you're going to be competing with your offspring for those same resources. And so that's one of the advantages of trying to kind of uh, disperse away like this. And so that's what these, these uh, mushrooms ultimately are doing, is they're releasing spores or seeds, kind of like the next generation of, of mushrooms. Now, you might be looking at it and saying, yeah, that's great. There's that mushroom, but what the heck is all this stuff going on underneath here? And this is where it gets really cool, in my opinion, is because when we're seeing a mushroom, it's basically just the tip of the iceberg. That's just part of that fungus, a little bit that's popping up above ground, but the bulk of it then is hidden underneath. It's hidden in the soil or in the log, uh, whatever it is that it's growing in for food. So we can see, yeah, these hyphae are kind of growing around down here, looking for food, basically, is, is what's happening. And so now we've talked about these mushrooms and we're saying, great, they're in this soil, they're in these logs or whatever, but what the heck are they actually doing? How are they mutualists? Are they <laughs> parasites? What's going on? And we can see that a number of them are actually decomposers in there where they're breaking down dead plant material uh, in, the, in, in the soil or you know, a log they're growing on. But we can see a number of them also form these beneficial partnerships with uh, plant roots that we're gonna talk about. And then we do also have some though that are nasty that are trying to kill plants. Um, they're out there trying to get, get their food. They're not giving anything back. Um, and some of them kind of blur the lines between categories. So this is one you've probably heard of already called armillaria. This is the honey mushroom or shoestring root rot fungus. Um, you can see these beautiful mushrooms popping up here. Um, and this is one that can kind of like shift back and forth between eating dead things and between being kind of like a plant parasite. Um, and if, if, if the right opportunities arise, it can, it can be a parasite. And it does this neat thing um, where it can spread by making these things here that uh, they look like shoelaces, essentially. <laughs> they're called rhizomorphs. And what they do is they're aggregations of hyphae that can spread up a tree they can spread through the soil like that. And they're really good at conducting things long distances. So they can help move water long distances. And this you may have also heard of because it's been uh, referred to as the humongous fungus. Um, and this actually has some roots kind of, kind of close, loosely speaking to us. Um, this initially was described in the, the upper peninsula of Michigan. And what had the, uh, what had happened was some folks were going out and they were collecting either these mushrooms or these rhizomorphs and they were sequencing DNA from them across a very large uh, spatial, <laughs> very large space. And they started finding, oh my gosh, these things are all genetically identical. This is the same fungus, the same individual that spread across this huge uh, area, 91 acres. They then tried to back, back calculate Okay, if it would spread at a certain rate, how old is this thing? 
And they came up with an age of 2,500 years, and they're estimating that it's uh, over 800,000 pounds. So what this is showing on the left here is this is showing different sampling locations and the uh, black uh, colors are, are certain genotypes that they were looking finding. So the black one was all one genotype they were kind of finding all over here. So one genetically identical individual. Um, so this is one kind of really cool mushroom out there that's a decomposer, but it might be kind of a nasty one too. And it just kind of illustrates that these can kind of blur the lines and that these can be really massive organisms that we don't really see up above ground, but underground, there's an awful lot um, happening. Another mushroom, this is um, one that you've all seen before, the, 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 the button mushroom, but you might be wondering what the heck is this thing doing in nature? Um, when we, you know, I'm used to seeing it in the grocery store, but in nature, it's actually a, a saprobe. So it's something that breaks down dead matter and it tends to kind of grow in, in meadows, uh, is my understanding of this. Um, and what's cool about this is that you go to the grocery store and you see these three kinds of mushrooms here. These are actually all the same species of, of mushroom. Um, we just have they're basically at different stages of their life cycle. So even though we buy them and we're like, oh, look, this portobello is clearly different. It's just a very mature criminy one. And a criminy is basically a more mature version of the, the white button mushroom. And so then we mentioned before that mushrooms um, underground, that, that fungus can also form these, these mycorrhizal relationships. And Mycorrhizal relationships are really cool. <laughs> so they are these partnerships between fungi and plant roots and nearly all plants have them. And this is something that when we look back in the fossil record, we actually find fossil evidence of these partnerships from over 400 million years ago. And the thought is, is that these partnerships may have helped facilitate the transition of plants onto land when they originally evolved out of water and, and transitioned onto land. And the way these work is there's a few different flavors of these associations. Um, the really common one is this arbuscular mycorrhizal one and evolutionarily that's the oldest as well. Um, but, the, but what happened, excuse me, uh, and there's other ones too that we're gonna talk about like these ectomycorrhizal ones. But at the, at the crux of it, what goes on is that the fungus is acting as an extension of the roots. So you can think about the plant roots and they're these kind of big blunt things that are in the soil. The, the fungal hyphae, what they are is they're, they're much finer and they're able to kind of get through all the nooks and crannies in the soil and go explore. And so they actually will extend away from the plant and access things like water or nitrogen and phosphorus. And they're able to transfer that back to the plant. And those are all really important things for a plant. The plant oftentimes can be limited by nitrogen and phosphorus. It can't grow fast enough unless it has enough nitrogen and phosphorus. And in return, the plant is sitting there doing its photosynthesis up above ground, making sugars, sending them down through the stem, through the roots, and giving some to the fungus. So they're basically trading resources back and forth here. Uh, and so this is a really beneficial and widespread type of association. And you can see here just the, uh, um, an image here showing um, some plants grown with mycorrhizal fungi on the left and without, and just kind of illustrating again that this can really have some massive consequences for how rapidly a plant is, is able to grow. And so, as I mentioned, there's a few different flavors of these mycorrhizal associations. And the one that's tied into, to, that's linked with mushrooms are these, these ectomycorrhizal fungi. So many things like, many trees like oaks and pines, for instance, form these ectomycorrhizal associations. And what this is, is this basically is a bunch of hyphae that are kind of wrapping around the root. And you can kind of think of it as like a glove. Like there's this glove going on over the plant root here. And then the filaments will extend out from the glove into the soil, looking for that uh, for different nu for nutrients and water. And then when that fungus fruits, it pops up above ground and makes this mushroom that we see. So if we were to dig down here, we might find this mushroom actually attached to a plant root. So these are these ectomycorrhizal ones. And things get even more complicated. So we can see there where we had this, this mutual list here, 
So this is you know a beneficial association where it's helping helping the uh, the plant. And that's exactly what's going on with this russula here. This is something that is another ectomycorrhizal one underground. It's helping the plants. But sometimes what we see is that it turns orange like this on the right. And this is something we would call the lobster mushroom. And what this is, is this is actually a totally different fungus that's coming along and trying to spoil the party here. This is a mycoparasite. So there are fungi that eat other fungi. And that's exactly what's going on here. This hypomyces makes this orange crust around the outside of that russula. And you can see it's kind of, you can see those gills kind of trying to protrude there. And you can see it just kind of looks a little bit deformed and weird. And that's exactly what's going on. And one of the consequences of this is that it would prevent the spores from dispersing from that russula. So we've got this mutualism going on here. Where we've got this russula helping the plant. But then we've got a parasitism coming along here with this hypomyces parasitizing the russula. So, so fungi are just a really uh, provide a lot of really exciting opportunities to study different types of interactions and, uh, their, and, and the, their directions. So are they mutualisms or, or parasitisms? Um, and then finally, I just want to touch on another group of, of macro fungi that you'll see a lot if you're walking around outside, especially right now. So these, these are lichens. These are things that are out year round. Um, that's why I say right now, because there aren't a lot of mushrooms that you're going to be looking for on the ground. If you look on the trees, though, you might see these lichens. And what this basically is, it's a, it's a partnership between fungus and algae. So think like pond scum, little tiny plants, you could, you could also say. And it works ultimately very similarly to how a mycorrhizal partnership works, where the uh, algae are photosynthesizing and giving sugars to the fungus. And so people have come up with these all sorts of definitions for, for what a lichen is. This is a very um, technical one here that I put up here. Um, but a, a simpler one is fungi that have discovered agriculture. The idea being that the fungus is caring for this algae and kind of farming them like a crop or like livestock, raising them for food and trying to protect them. And one of the fascinating things to me about these lichen associations is that on the right here, we have this lichen. It's making this thing we call a phallus. So when we see a lichen out in nature, it's got both partners in there. And it's making this, this fancy structure here. But if we were to separate out the individual symbionts, the individual partners, and grow them on their own in the lab, we'd see they look nothing like this on the right, nothing at all. So on the left, this is actually the fungus that's making this whole phallus, that constructs that phallus. It just looks like this blob on the left. And these algae are just kind of boring little round green things. But when compatible partners meet, something happens that we don't fully understand how this works, but the fungus suddenly differentiates. It's like a transformer. It suddenly turns into something completely different and it will make this new phallus like this that will house the algae inside. And if we were to make a section through that phallus, like look inside of it, we'd see it's actually layered. Uh, what we would see is there's like an upper cortex. So you can kind of look at it sort of like this. There's like this top layer of fungal tissue going along. Underneath it, we can see it'll arrange the algae right underneath that layer of, of tissue. Then we'll have a loose layer of fungal tissue, kind of like that, and then another cortex on the bottom. So we can see this kind of internal stratification. It kind of looks like a sandwich, ultimately. And what goes on there is that this uh, these algae then are, as we said, they're photosynthesizing in there, making these sugars and the fungus is wrapped around it and it will leak carbohydrates or these sugars to the fungus. So the fungus it's thought is getting all of its food from those algae. They have to feed themselves and this big old fungus that's making that whole phallus um, for it. And so this has raised the question of, is this really a mutualism? So a lot of times people tend to think of lichens as mutualists. Um, and one of the thoughts is, is this just some sort of parasitism? Like it doesn't seem like the algae are getting a whole lot out of this. They have to feed themselves and this whole fungus. And so this has led to you know, cartoons like this where these algae are in this jail 
arranged like a lichen phallus here with the cortex. Um, and here's the fungus taking off with the keys. Um, so yeah, some have wondered, is this instead just a controlled parasitism? And I think it's important to think about it in kind of a broader context here. Um, so yes, from that, from that perspective, what we described so far, doesn't seem like the algae are getting much out of this. But uh, by constructing that thallus, the fungus is actually protecting the algae. Um, what it's doing is it's uh, sometimes making chemicals in this upper layer that will filter out UV radiation and allow it to live in really high light conditions it might not normally be able to. It's providing it water, um, nutrients that it absorbs, and it's, yeah, it just has this kind of physical protection for it. And ultimately, uh, it's kind of functioning as like a mini greenhouse. Um, for the algae. So there's, there's benefits um, to it. And ultimately, both of these partners are now able to occupy habitats together that they wouldn't be able to on their own. So this is kind of what has led uh, folks to generally come down on the mutualistic side of, of things. Um, briefly, I just want to showcase a little bit of the diversity. We can see these have evolved into a number of shapes, colors, and sizes here, all different sorts of textures. They have occupy every continent. So they've been very kind of successful. Um, in terms of their diversity, we know of about like 18,000 or so. It's probably closer to 20,000 now. And there's actually two that are on the federal endangered species list. Uh, this uh, Cladonia perforata is in the scrub habitats of Florida and this Gymnoderma is in the, the Smokies. Um, I've actually seen the gymnoderma before. Um, it's really, really beautiful. <laughs> kind of grows on rock faces and in streams. Um, we can see the bulk of them. If we kind of think, take a higher level view of fungi, we can see the bulk of them are in the ascomycota, which is the phylum that contains things like morels, penicillium, uh, saccharomyces, uh, uh, lineages like that, while only a handful are in the basidiomycota, which is where we tend to think of most of the mushrooms as being. Um, in North America, we know of about 5,400 species, and there's even ones that will parasitize the lichens. So we know of some fungi that, again, are mycoparasites that might parasitize the lichen and um, function as cheaters here. And roughly speaking, um, we know of uh, about 10,000 non-lichenized macrofungi in, in North America here. This is uh, some work that, that Greg had, had done a little bit ago. Um, maybe, I don't know if it needs to be updated or not. Greg would know better than me, but um, yeah. And so in Chicago, actually, in the broader Chicago area, um, we have quite a, a lot of species. We, they're not very big and showy though. Um, so we, we know of about, close to 300 species in the, the broader Chicago area. Um, here's a few of the more common ones you'll see. If you look around, oftentimes they're very small and you'll need a hand lens, but if you pick up a twig, you're very likely to see this Physia stellaris, this kind of grayish leafy lichen with these uh, apothecia, these cups or discs there. That's, the, that's basically the mushroom that the ascomycetes make. Um, sometimes even on concrete, You'll see these little tiny apothecia in there, little orange guys. Um, so yeah, there's actually a, a bit of diversity here to be found. And so ultimately, if we come back to this question now of um, fungi, are they friendly or deadly? I, I would say it really depends. I realize you might say that's a cop-out answer, but I think it really does. Um, I think it depends on what fungus we're talking about. Some, um, they're, what, what they do is they you know, go after mammals. They live in the lungs of mammals. So in some cases, that's what they do. Um, but there's so, but I, I think it's terrible to just um, blanket, you know, a broadly assign uh, this bad category to all fungi. There's so many more that are not harming us in any way that are helping us in different ways or that are just not, not doing anything to us. <laughs> So I think it depends on what the fungus is, what the context is, um, and then a number of other circumstances, such as uh, nutrient temperature, climate, and all that. That can sometimes impact whether you're looking at a parasitism or mutualism, um, especially with some of these mycorrhizal associations. Um, so with that, I just want to highlight um, a few resources that are available. Um, if you're interested, Patrick has a wonderful website, Mushroom Expert. Um, 
my colleague and friend, Todd Widhelm, he and Torsten Lumsch made a really nice field guide to lichens of the Chicago area. Jerry Wilhelm has been working on a new treatment, I think with Todd Widhelm on uh, lichens of the kind of broader Chicago area. There's a number of, of uh, books here that and that that may be useful, and of course the IMA. <laughs> so, thanks everyone. By the way, somebody wanted to know who was the professor that made mycology exciting for you. Uh, her name is Andrea Gargas. Uh, yeah, so so she was yeah my mycology professor, um, and ironically, I can remember. <laughs> She, when we were taking mycology, she said at that point, it was when DNA sequencing was just kind of coming to the forefront and a lot of the, the taxonomy, oops, a lot of the um, classification was being rearranged because we had previously um, classified them based on all sorts of shapes and structures that it turns out don't really reflect evolutionary relationships all that well. She's like, it's like we're taking everything out of the closet right now and we're trying to reorganize it. And I still feel like it's it's still kind of that way in some regards. I don't know if if you all would agree, but I we're, we're getting closer to having the the classification reflect the evolutionary history. But even twenty, it's been twenty years, and I thought it'd all be settled by now. But yeah, so Andrea and then um, Susan Will Wolf is another person I worked very closely with um, early on, and those two, and then Robert Luking eventually at the Field Museum really um, provided a lot of opportunities for me to start seeing the tropics, um, which is really fascinating. And yeah, so I've had a number of people along the way. <laughs> Torsten Lunch, yeah, just tons of people. Are there any edible lichens? Um, yeah, so in uh, parts of, it, it kind of varies across the globe. I think there's a, a, a bit of a um, kind of cultural dimension to it. So in, in, in parts of like China, so in like Yunnan, for instance, in Southwest China, there's a number of different lichens that are eaten there. Some are used in teas. Um, so like there's something called snow tea, which is this white lichen that makes these stalks that come up in real, it lives in kind of mountaintops um, and it also looks like snow. <laughs> um, so that'll be used, but some of the more leafy lichens are also used as food. And there's thoughts too then that like, when people are starving, folks might have used uh, this thing called rock tripe or umbilicaria um, as, a, as a food source. I don't know that that would taste very good, but um, there definitely are some. And one of the speakers that um, Catherine invited last year uh, had a really nice presentation on uh, how, how lichens are used uh, in, I think it's in masalas. Was that? Yeah, Indian curries and such. In fact, at the time we have the recording, knock on wood, we have the recording, but at the time she was presenting, she was publishing a paper. So I'm going to go back and ask her if we can uh, remove it from embargo. Maybe not, but that would be great because I know there's people who would like to hear that again. And, and that inspired Todd Widhelm and I then to go on a quest into all sorts of Indian grocery stores around Chicago trying to find this. And we found a number of different varieties of it that we, we have uh, at the museum right now. <laughs> so yeah. Well, hi, that, that's kind of interesting sidelight. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, do you have any advice for someone hoping to pursue mycology professionally? Well, we have several professional people here today who might have different answers. <laughs> Um, I would, I would say um, the best way would be to try to get in touch with some of the professionals and see if they they have opportunities. I think I think a lot of um, people in positions such as professor or research positions are eager to help folks as best they can, and so I think talking with them is kind of a great way to try to get started. Um, I don't know, G Greg, Patrick, any anyone else? What would you all? Any other folks? Yeah, I guess I'd go along with what you just said, Matt. Um, you know, um, depending on where you are in your career, right? You're in a, depending on and what you want to do. Um, oftentimes, it takes all the way to get a PhD and then a postdoc and whatever else. So um, you want to really be passionate about it because um, it takes persistence. I guess I would say, besides being good at it. Um, 
but there are wonderful ways that you can contribute to mycology um, even without getting an advanced degree. Uh, you know, there's a lot of incredible um, um, examples of what um, non-professionally employed uh, community scientists have uh, provided to the mycological world. So I think it depends on what you want to do. Uh, and then you just kind of figure out what your education track you need to be to get there and try to get some experience. Patrick, do you want to join in or? Um, I don't have anything to add other than um, I can point out a few exceptional non-professionals, if you want to call them that. They're not, they're not paid to be mycologists, but Michael Kuo is an English teacher who's now retired. He has probably the best website for the Midwest, if not one of the ones for the country, mushroomexpert.com. Uh, he's been building that over the years, and he's just an English teacher who loves fungi. And Rod Tullis has a, has a big website on Ammonita, and he's a, I think, chemical engineer by trade or something like that. So there's a lot of amateurs. Um, also, we've had, um, oh, I forgot her name now, um, from last week who did, or uh, a couple weeks ago, well, did the um, Mushroom Color Atlas, which is really cool about dye fungi. Really cool website on that. And by uh, the way, Julie in, Beeler. Julie Beeler, yeah. And in Europe, there's uh, tons of amateurs that contribute to new species and everything. So there's certainly room for us to do that in North America, have more amateur involvement in um, documenting and finding fungi and um, getting them figured out. Yeah, Paul Stamis isn't a bad example either. Oh yeah, he's rock star. A lot of you know Juliana Furchi. That's another person that uh, has been making major uh, contributions to mycology. But if you go to NAMA, there's all kind of wonderful um, leaders in NAMA that's that's moving things forward. So it, it really kind of depends on what you want to do. There's, I would say, the same kind of holds in the kind of outside of mushrooms, but in the, 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 the lichen world um, also, there's a lot of people that are not necessarily paid and maybe not technically considered professionals, but exactly as, as Greg and Patrick said, are describing new species, really catalog, cataloging diversity. So they may not have this fancy piece of paper, but they're doing all the work and everything else. Um, um, Stephanie mentioned medical mycology is another route. Uh, other routes are um, plant pathology and forestry type studies, where you study the fungi that affect trees. And now there's growing numbers of, um, what do we call it, alternative. So um, there's companies developing uh, fungal fibers and fungal packing material and um, alternatives to meat and fish and things like that using fungi. So there's just, uh, you know, use your imagination and there's something that's going on with fungi right now. Now we got the local publishers. We got what, Britt Bunyard and Leon Chernoff? Yep. So I'm sorry, I don't know who Peter McCoy is. He does uh, radical mycology. So I think some of that is kind of like micro remediation in, in some regard, but also I think kind of make uh, my understanding is one of the kind of the, the main um, thrusts of, of his work is that he wants to kind of make it so everyone is able to do research. You don't need all this fancy lab equipment. You're able to do it with very simple um, equipment that's around everywhere, like little mason jars or something like that. And I know, I think he's done some work with trying to figure out how to like get fungi to break down cigarette butts, for instance, um, things like that. Something for everybody. Um, when you were talking about Rochella brevites uh, being parasit parasitized by another fungus, is the parasitism observable in the hyphae below ground as well? This is a question I've been wondering and have been asked before, and I do not have the answer. I was wondering if, if Greg or Patrick do. When, when the hypomyces is growing over that, that russula, does it grow underground too, or is it just the above ground part, the mushroom? Uh, don't quote me, but I think it's only on the above ground part. But uh, I, I can't say that with 
100 uh, certainty patrick what do you think yeah i don't know but i i do know that it gets on there really early because it's um some hypomyces that grow on other fungi you can kind of see more of the original mushroom but in the lobster mushroom you don't see any of the original it, the rustle it's totally covered up so it it starts developing right probably in the primordium i don't know so the spores must be just hanging out in the soil waiting for little rustle of pinheads i don't know but that's a big question is how does it uh get on there so fast is it does it maybe follow the rustle of hyphae who knows what it's doing down there um, who is researching mycology for living architectural structures or living built environments? That's a good question. I can think of non-living architectural work and non-living um, built environments. Um, so I know there's a, I'll, I'll just start with that. I know there's been some work, for instance, out of like Berkeley, where they've been trying to look within, uh, and this I think ultimately kind of stems from some research that's been done on bacteria, um, where they are trying to look in different apartments within an apartment complex, trying to look at how similar is everyone's mycota, basically you could say, are, are the fungi there? And then they start thinking about different variables, like, okay, what if you have a dog? Are, are your fungi that you on yourself have more similar to your dogs than to elsewhere, or that, you know, to people who don't have this dog? Um, They'll look at, you know, doorknobs as well, dust. And so they're really trying to look at all sorts of um, kind of fungal diversity and composition across all different parts of the, the um, built environment. Um, and similarly, there's a lot of interest in fungi that are growing on like monuments because or many of them are lichens that are growing on monuments and they over time will weather the, um, the stones, so the fungi will kind of penetrate into the nooks and crannies of the soil, uh, of, the, of the rock and kind of increase those cracks a bit bigger, so things flake off. Some might make acids um, that will kind of help break that down. But in terms of the living built environments um, or living architectural structures, I don't know, and I would, yes, yeah, see if Greg or Patrick are I mean, I don't, depends what you define. So there are people building, um, you know, blocks out of fungal mycelium. Um, there seems to be growing interest in using fungi as an insulation. So you would actually blow and have the fungi grow in between, you know, the outer wall and the inner wall to be for uh, insulation. Uh, so there's that type of material there's a lot of stuff of using fungi as alternatives to other building materials i guess i would say but i don't know anybody who's growing a house you know it's all using mycelium growing the blocks then the blocks are stabilized and using those blocks then to, to move forward but at least that's that's all i know i don't know there might be somebody building a house that way but i don't know well, in the small structure department, you can have a coffin made out of mushrooms, right? Yeah, there's clothes, there's food that I see uh, that uh, Doug Bishop's talking about the sneakers, there's clothes made out of it, there's uh, new leather being made. So some of you have seen um, Paul Stamitz's, and I've got one of those too, the hats made out of mushroom felt, but now they're actually growing mushroom leather. Um, and I'm waiting for that because I really want a mushroom leather vest, uh, but they haven't marketed those yet, but that's going to be cool. And the, the coffin, that was partly, I don't know if any of you have seen, there's a TED talk about uh, this person who's making themselves a uh, mushroom impregnated shroud. So when they die, it will speed up their uh, decomposition and recycle their body. So. Hey, something for the newsletter, Stephanie. <laughs> Are there any more questions? So uh, we'll see you next month. Uh, thank, and if you have any um, newsletter contributions, we now have a new newsletter editor. So we have Stephanie Kowalik. And uh, I think that's it. We'll see you next month. And we will, we, you, know, you saw last week, we did at least send two special emails of events that were happening like just very soon. 
We often put information about events also on uh, from other clubs and stuff on Facebook. So you can check that out. All righty. I think that's it. Good night, everybody. And we'll see you soon. I'm just curious if we can. Thank you. Here. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank Matt, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for asking me. Um, yeah. Thank you for doing it. I love talking fungi, so not not an issue. <laughs> <laughs> not an issue. <laughs> that is great. <laughs>